Well, I've come to learn that I don't believe in balance. I don't think that things are meant to be, you know, equal, but there is a fair, you know, there's a difference between fairness and equal. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Fairley. How do I serve the tribe? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? Most unselfish thing a person can do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Show. Man, thank you so much for being here. I'm your host, Nicholas Barely. If you're watching on YouTube, which I know you are, go ahead and click that subscribe button, ring that little bell. That way you get new things in your newsfeed that feed your mind, feed your soul, and feed the actions that you take every single day because it starts with ingesting, then digesting, and then expressing. And the best way to do it is to click that subscribe button, ring that bell so they get more episodes just like this. Yo, Jeremy, welcome to the Billion Dollar Brotherhood podcast. Hey, brother, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm glad you showed up with a mic. This ain't Clubhouse no more. Some of these people I've been meeting on Clubhouse, dude, they've been showing up like it's Clubhouse. They're like iPhone in hand. I'm like, dog, where's your mic? You came prepared and you're looking great, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here with you today. Yeah, we, we originally met on Clubhouse. I believe, actually, I saw you. You stood out to me for, for two reasons I want to give you credit for. It was a all about communication, speaking and, and storytelling. And you were in there asking questions saying, Hey, like I want to speak more, but I, I don't know this thing to do. I don't know this thing to do. And I'll look at your profile and I'm like, dude, this guy exited a company that's $70 million in sales with a thousand plus people. This guy has a great cause of freeing women from sex trafficking, which has been something that our company's partnered with, with underground railroad in the past, as well as unlikely heroes uh, and a few other companies. I was like, this guy's legit. And he's a learner. And some of the best people in my life, the people listening in the very beginning, some of the best people in my life that I've ever seen, from Russell Brunson to the Peng Junes to, the, to whoever, Grant Cardone, doesn't matter, they've consistently been the people that show up in the, front of the, in the front of the room and they're taking notes, not just the guy who's speaking, gathering the crowd and not learning anymore, dude. So I, I appreciate that. That was the reason why I reached out was because I was like, this guy's freaking legit, but you're a freaking learner. Thank you. Can you touch on it though? Like- Touch on this subject of you've done a lot of things. Yeah. You could easily just show up like you're, you know it all. And, and here's the problem is people believe it. One last little thing. Uh, let's say um, CEO, uh, old CEO of Apple, right? Steve Jobs. People always say, Nicholas, why do you dress up like Steve Jobs? He wore the same thing every single day because he didn't want decision fatigue, right? And my thing about that is I go, why doesn't he just have someone pick out his clothes? But it was something that he wasn't good at. He was just like, who cares about clothes? And he was so rich that everyone's like, well, he's legit already. Whereas some people, when they're first coming and proving themselves, like you have to dress nice. You can't just show up like a freaking slob everywhere you go. And same thing with rich people or successful people when they're not learners or they come across like they're not learners, then all these other people just think they have to be the same way. So touch on it for me. You're successful. That's why you're here. Yet, you're such a freaking good learner. Tell me the balance of that for the other guys out there. Yeah, let me start by telling you like kind of where that comes from, I think, as I as I as I look back to my childhood and 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 where I've come from is well, one, I've always had this desire to progress. I've always had this desire to be better. Um, that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing where it's like you never settle, you're never good enough. You're you're always searching for this next level, right? Um, when I was a young man. I had this belief that I was not, I was not smart enough that I was, it was actually worse than that. It was that I was stupid. Um, I thought I was dumb. And, and, and the reason being is like, I'd be in a, a church class and they'd be asking, talking about a certain topic and, and they'd get into, they'd ask questions and I'd be like, Oh, please don't call on me. Oh, please don't look like, I don't know this answer. Same thing in school. Um, and so I had this belief that everybody else knew and I didn't know. And so I needed to work extra hard uh, in order to know. And so um, that's transitioned for me that I don't believe that I'm stupid. I, I believe that everybody is a genius um, in their own right. Um, however, I have this yearning desire just to learn more, to know more, to be more experienced in areas that I feel that either I lack confidence or that I haven't had a lot of experience. And so um, it's just, I think that's what you caught in that, in that moment was me going, 
man, I, I'd love to be a better speaker. I'd love to be able to share my story better. I'd love to, I'd love to get out there more. And I, I just want to, I just want to learn. And, and I know there's people that are much more advanced that I could, I could glean that, that uh, knowledge from. So. Totally. And there's a lot of people out there that are influencers that never show that side, right? yeah. they just show all the perfect things. And for the people listening, the hard part about that is that you have to keep that persona all the time, even when you don't know what's going on. Whereas when you lean from your side of, Hey, like I'm here to learn as well. I'm good at this stuff, but I want to be good at this stuff. That, that expectation of yeah. being amazing at everything kind of falls to the wayside. Uh, tell me as well, because I believe this is a big topic. Tell me some of the motivation of helping free women from sex trafficking and, and some of the work that you're doing with that. Yeah. I want to make sure this is towards the front of the show, because I believe this is a really big deal. Uh, yeah. We partnered with unlikely heroes and, they took one woman out of sex slavery and got her educated and, and got her a uh, place to stay and then get yeah. a job that was outside the industry. And that was so fulfilling. Tell me some of the work that you're doing. Yeah. So, um, a, a number of years ago, my wife and I saw a movie and there was in, in this movie they showed, um, it was a documentary and they were showing what was going on and, and what existed. And there was this young boy that had been kidnapped and taken into sex trafficking and they were looking for him and, I was a new dad. Um, I had a, my firstborn son, uh, was two years old. And I'm like, if something like this happened to my son, I would hope that anybody that I know and anyone I don't know would drop everything to go and, and help find him and bring him home. And that's what struck a chord. And at the end of this movie, it was like, I, I won't be, I will never be the same. I, and I can't look away now. And so my wife and I committed to look into this more. We didn't know that it existed. We didn't know that this was a big problem. And, um, and so we, um, we started looking around and, and sure enough, the, um, one of the largest organizations operation on the ground railroad is locally, uh, local here to Utah. And, and, um, I actually happened to know some people that, um, you know, were in the organization or involved in the organization. And so I just started seeking out how we could get more involved. And, and we ended up, my wife ended up doing a, a CrossFit competition, uh, to raise money for it. And, um, we went to a, a black tie gala and, and, um, learn more and more. And, and at the end of this, there was this moment where my, you know, I, I had this desire to get involved, but I didn't really s express what that was uh, to my wife at the time. But what it was, was I wanted to go undercover. I wanted to go and help rescue these children. I want to be on the front line. I didn't want to just donate money. I didn't want to just, I really, really wanted to get involved. And so um, at the end of this um, charity event, they actually had some of the undercover operators stand up and, and were recognized. And I was just like this fire burning inside of my wife's like, you'd be so good at that. And I was like, you'd let me do that. And, um, she's like, yeah, it's important. I was like, well, do you know what that means? And so I tried to like do a little pulse check on it. And she's like, no, I, I truly believe in this. And I think you'd be great. I'd, I'd totally support it. So, um, I went right to work. I went and found, um, found somebody and, and went through a whole process to get involved. And, I uh, was very, very, very fortunate. It's not something that just anybody can get involved in, but went through some fight training, uh, about eight months of uh, Krav Maga to understand the mental and physical aspect if you get into a certain situation. And just so happened we were at, we were in um, we were in Orlando, Florida. We were at Disney World with my parents and my siblings and all of the kids and um, my son and wife. And and I got the call. It's time to go. So I I up and flew out of Disney World to South America and was gone for uh, 48 hours and during that time we um we met with the you know we're basically non um we're, we're voluntary uh criminal informants um and we um, play a specific role in, in helping lure these traffickers in uh to throw you know a, a party and bring these girls and uh, we met with the federal police out there and structured everything met with the traffickers the night before and um, these evil, evil people face to face, and we had to play this role of buddies with them, and and um, and the girls will never know that we weren't these bad guys. But um, we we had them in, and and there was 48, 48 girls that came between the ages of thirteen and eighteen, and um, a handful of traffickers, and and um, everything played out as uh, you know generally to plan and and um 70 federal agents rushed in and and rescued these these children it was the largest single uh rescue operation in the host country's um, history um doctors come in and aftercare as you know from you know your experience 
um, the most important part there once you get them out. Um, but what was most profound for me was I left, um, I left this takedown. We get to the airport, I'm calling family, letting them know we're okay. And they're like, man, you must feel amazing right now. And I was like, no, I don't. I feel dirty and gross and, and angry and all of the, all of the feelings. But the very next day is when I had my profound experience. I was standing in line back at Disney World, if you can imagine this. And people are complaining about the heat. People are complaining about the lines. And I'm just like, you have no idea what's going on in the world. Like my experience was was so dramatic. And and I got a text message from one of the brothers um, from the undercover team. And he said, brothers, happy Father's Day. <laughs> and uh, if you remember, like this whole thing started as me being a father, thinking about these fathers that had lost their children. And um, he said, happy Father's Day. Today will always be a special day as we remember the reunions that we helped create today. Um, and uh, it just hit me, um, you know, and and changed my life forever. I, I'll never not be committed to helping um, in any way that I can, whether it's bringing awareness, whether it's going undercover, whether it's donating money. Um, it's a real problem that exists in the world today. And and um, and it feels really good to be a part of, of such a noble cause. Yeah, man, that's phenomenal. And, and one thing as well is like you're in you're in the state or the country that is the number one consumer of goods, right? Like the big problem, the one that's creating demand. Just super well. Yeah, you're you're sitting there like well, looking around, going, "Well, who the heck is it?" You know, like do we pass them on the streets or do we see them in the big towers? Yeah, it's super intense. And and you said two things like. One that that how it hit you the reality back at home. Those are great experiences. Those are tough though when yeah. people are complaining. I remember I I wanted to be successful when I was eighteen, and all the kids in my high school they all wanted to like on the weekends watch movies, and I was so pissed that I would show up. I'd be like complaining, and I'd be sitting there and I'd be with my book, and just to make a point, I'd be reading the book in the corner while everyone's watching a movie. But I was so pissed that everyone else couldn't see what I saw. I'm like, no, like this is not what we do. Like we need to be focused. And those moments are difficult sometimes because you feel alone, right? Yeah. Like I bet every entrepreneur listening right now actually has probably felt that before. Touch on that. Like you probably felt alone thinking I'm the only one that knows about this. And all these freaking people are over here complaining about ice cream or complaining about, you know, who's going to be in this Congress position or whatever it is. Tell me about that reality. How'd you deal with that? Yeah, it was fascinating. Um, it, it was met with a little bit of frustration at first. Um, like this is the small stuff, even my family. Like I was in a totally different realm, a totally different mind space. I was feeling totally different in my body. I was so full of gratitude. I was so full of joy. I was so full of love for my family and everybody. And then these little things, I'm like, come on, you know? Um, and at the same time, um, I had to give some grace. It's like, you don't know, like they don't know what they don't know. And 48 hours prior, I had no idea either. And so there was just this, this massive amount of like, okay, I've got to give people grace. I've got to give understanding. And how much more important is it that I share? How much more important is it now that you know, you can't turn away. You have to share these things. You have to help other people understand. And so, you know, it's this interesting, it's this interesting thing that, that, um, you know, experience that changes you and, um, going forward, you know, I come home from Disney world and, and I'm back into my business and I'm sitting in my office and I'm going, what am I doing with my life? Like, this is so <laughs> not meaningful. This is so not worthwhile, right? Yeah. You compare anything to it and you just go, man, I'm, I'm wasting my life away. However, at the same time, you realize like there's there's a lot bigger, more important things you can do and it's a lot more fulfilling and, you know, don't don't sleep on it. Get, get to work. So, yeah. And it seems like that could, you could use that as a bigger motivation because you come back home and you're like, What's the motivation? There's there's greater urgency out there. There's something more important that takes a priority, and sometimes that can be demotivating if we don't set it up as somehow yeah. like a like carrot in front of us. Is there something that you did a shift in the business, or did you just shift? Hey, if we if we do better in business, then we can help out more. What was that mindset shift to capture that and allow that to propel you forward in business? Yeah, great question. So there was two things that happened for me. Um, one, there was this belief that I had had prior to that somewhere deep rooted, um, unconscious, subconscious about money and about money being bad. 
you know, you grow up and you're, you you hear this, you know, if you're a, a church going uh, person or Bible reading person, you, you hear about this scripture of uh, money is the root of all evil. And it's actually not the scripture. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. And, and, but somehow in there, I had twisted this thing of like having a desire for making a lot of money is not a good thing. And, and so when everybody would ask like, what do you want? And da, 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 it was always like, well, I want to help people and I want to do this, which I did. However, I would beat around the bush of like, I want to make a ton of money and I want to do a ton of really cool things. And I want to have great experiences. And I also want to save lives and do all these things right with it. But when I went on that um, operation, I looked around, I had a moment where I looked around and you've got, there was a very, very incredible group of people and men that were there that were very successful businessmen that had, there wasn't a non-millionaire on this trip. And um, the money that was forked out for this was a substantial amount of money. Um, you know, when we, the day before we were buying, you know, certain things for this party and whatever else. And it was like, it was my first operation. So I'm the one who's picking this up. And I remember that night before when certain things got a little uh, sketchy and you never know whether it's the biggest worry the night before is, are they going to show up tomorrow? We've been working on this for eight months. Is this going to, are they going to show up? And I remember looking myself literally in the mirror. I was standing in the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and I was like, if I have to empty my bank account in order to make sure that this goes through, I will do it. Like it, there's nothing I won't do right now. We are in this, we're making this thing happen. And so that was the realization that I had on, on, on money um, that changed me. And, and I had this strong renewed desire to make a lot of money and, and that it's important that without those resources, we couldn't have made that happen. You just can't. And so um, it was a necessary tool and um, it, it changed my perspective around money dramatically. The second thing was I didn't feel like the work I was doing was super meaningful. So there was like, okay, the work is going to, certain work is going to be for, um, you know, achievement in order to then have the fulfillment, but where else can I have like the fulfilling aspect of it? And that's actually, it's interesting. We started with talking about speaking more. Um, I had this desire to speak. Um, I had this strong desire because I had, I had experienced it a few times where I spoke on stage and, and I had people come up and, and, um, I had people come up and, and share that they, you know, they, it had impacted them in a certain way. And that was the closest I had come towards like really helping impact somebody. And so, um, I shortly after that got asked to speak at a conference and, and I stood up and I spoke and, and I had dozen people come up to me afterwards and tell me that it had impacted their life and changed them. And, and so I made this strong effort. That's when I started getting more active on social media. Um, I started saying yes to podcasts. I started talking on, you know, other areas, even though it was a, a fear of mine, it was an area that I didn't feel as comfortable. It was that area where I felt like um, I can't be undercover all times, you know, every day out there rescuing children. But if I can share my story and that can impact somebody, um, that that's worthwhile. That is so cool, dude. Tell me before we move on from this, you, you went in undercover. Tell me what that was like. Cause there's only 48 hours, but you had all this training beforehand. Yeah. You said you left there feeling kind of dirty. It was one descriptive word. Yeah. It's probably cause you were, you know, hanging around acting like these freaking people. That's probably counterintuitive to how you grew up. Yeah. Like that must've been super weird. Walk me through that. The highlights of that. Yeah. Having to act like them, communicating with them, befriending these people. Like, was there a weird yeah, struggle literally. of like, am I really being friends with this person? Like, yeah, yeah. that's weird. Yeah. So I'll tell you this experience, this, this moment and you know, certain details, obviously I can't share, but we're, we're in a, we're in a bar in late at night. It's probably 11 o'clock and we were there till about one in the morning. We're meeting with the traffickers. There's different groups that we were meeting with and we need to let them know that there was going to be another group that's going to be there because we were trying to get as many as we could in there and let them lay out the rules. No, no weapons, no whatever, but just broing it up. So this trafficker gets out of the car and we go up and we give him a big hug and we're high fiving them and, you know, we're fist bumping. But this, you know, this two hour conversation is him showing us pictures on his phone of these little girls and us talking about what we're going to do and sharing it just the most vile disgusting conversation you could ever have and we're doing it with a smile on our face we're high-fiving we're fist bumping and um and i noticed myself i was literally sitting like this directly across from trafficker with a few other people here and um as i'm talking you know i'm keeping this up and playing this role 
But then when I noticed he's talking to somebody else, I, I felt the blood just drain out of my face. And I felt it just like my serious face come on. I'm like, oh, no, I can't, I can't do that. I had to snap right back into it. Um, because you're just not – as much as you think you're – as much as I thought I was prepared for this, like I can play this role, I can do whatever else, it was heavy and emotionally draining. Like we got in the cab to leave afterwards, and I like they're like, so how do you feel? And I was like exhausted. Like – I am exhausted. I couldn't even talk. I was so exhausted thinking about all the things going on. What if they catch on to us? What if what all the things, right? Um, Cause you're dealing with some very, very serious people. And, um, and so that's, that's what that was like. And then the, the next day was like, please just show up, please just show up. And, and, and then you're standing in front of these little girls and they think you're these terrible humans. And, there's this one girl that I'll, I'll never forget. She's she was 13. She had braces on, and I don't know about you, but a 13 year old. I'm six foot three and 215 pounds. She comes up to about my belly button, and um, you know maybe my chest. And I'm like, you know, I just kept going around. I had this thing that I kept saying was today's going to be a good day, but I kept saying it more of like a dirty like oh, today's going to be a good day. Da, da. And they're looking at me like, yeah, maybe for you, but not for me. But what I was saying to my subconscious and to myself was today's going to be a good day. It's not going to happen. What's happened to you before you're getting out, you're going to be safe. And um, I'm just so happy that you're here. Um, today's going to be a good day. And so that's yeah. what kept me going through. What were these, these people like, were they feel, were these traffickers Were they, did they seem like normal people? Yeah. You would never know. Never know. You'd never know. I mean, you just, you look around and you could, have a line of 50 people and you go, which, which ones they all, it, it could be any of them. It's crazy. Dude, Fact. that is so insane. Ah, yeah. oh, it's tough to go into topics like this because then it's like, okay, well, what about that business strategy that somewhat doesn't matter at this point? Yeah. Uh, because, it, because this is serious stuff yet, you know, it's just nice for people to, to see really behind the scenes, what motivates people, what people are into. I met a guy once that I don't know how much he like, I don't even know how I got in the room, but he did his own private rescue missions and he would fly in his plane, but they would do like the opposite style where they would just delete all the prospects themselves and take all the women and, and whoever else. Yeah. And it was, it was crazy to see how motivated he was for one thing. And one thing I learned from him is he would actually watch footage. They would do like recon and they get footage of all these people and he would actually play it in his house all day, 24 seven, mm -hmm. because it would just motivate him. He would yeah. sit there and be like, that guy, that's the guy that we're gonna go get. And like, I was, was like, whoa, like I need to keep my goals in front of me. Like I'm not as motivated as this guy for a cause, yet if we can kind of put the cause and the business together and have a purpose behind it, I believe that can help us go a lot further. So take me back, just, I, I don't know you well, like this isn't me. Yeah you know, jumping back for no reason. I'm like, man, I want to hear the stepping stones to obviously now you're like creating these profitable businesses and selling them yet. I'm like, how did you get into the business you are now? Cause you were like door to door business. And then now like right dentistry style businesses. And like, how, how did you get started in what you're doing? And what were the stepping stones of businesses that you took to get to doing what you're doing now? Yeah. So when I was, you know, uh, a young kid. Um, I grew up in a middle class, I'd say upper middle class um, neighborhood and kids would get cars when they turned 16. You know, their families had boats and, and dirt bikes and Harleys and things like that. And, and I was like, that was my jam. Those were things that like, man, this is fun. I love the thrill. I love the exciting, but those were the things that were important to, to my parents. And so we didn't have those things. And um, we didn't get things just given to us when we turned 16. We were absolutely fortunate. They took us on vacations and everything else. But it was like, if you want to have a car when you turn 16, at age 14, I'm being told this, then you better get to work. And, and so, then, and what did your parents do? My dad, so my dad taught seminars um, for a number of years. And then he he's an entrepreneur. He, he started a juice bar and then he had a, a furniture store and a travel agency. And, you know, he was an entrepreneur. And so he showed us that path. However, he was saying, don't, you don't want this life. Go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, right? Um, this is too hectic. You don't clock in and clock out. You're always on the clock type thing. And so, um, but that was the modeling that I had. And so, um, you know, as a young kid, I had newspaper out. I, 
you know, a lawn mowing company. I washed windows with a guy and then I end up leaving the window washing company and starting my own window washing company. And this is like, as a kid growing up, that's what we did. We worked hard and, and, and earned money. And so, um, you know, that, that transition, I, I was always just kind of progressing. It's like, oh, if I was a started as a bus boy, I became a cook and then I became a server or whatever else. I was always trying to find that next, you know, uh, that next opportunity. And then um, I went and served a two year mission for my church. Um, I was in California full full time, you know, for two years, um, you know, preaching the gospel. And and, you know, and, and that's, you know, probably the toughest thing to sell is, you know, religion uh door to door and that's what kind of got me my eyes open to the door to door uh world. and i came home from that and and i had a brother-in-law that was um, knocking door to door selling internet phone and tv products and um he spent a little bit of time with me teaching me how to do it uh in the classroom for about an hour and then he went out on the doors and said just follow me and watch and see what i do and and then halfway through the day he said you know you knock the door and um and I, I quickly, you know, caught on to this, uh, got into way more doors than I did when I was selling religion. And, and uh, you know, that that was in, in um, June of 2008. And from June of 2008 to May of 2009, I went from a sales rep, um, just knocking and selling by myself, to a sales manager, and then from a sales manager to a regional manager. Um, and so by May of 20, 2009, I was a regional manager. I had five managers and 60 sales reps um, in my stewardship. And we went out to do our first summer sales program. Uh, if you're familiar with it, it's big in Utah, but kids, you know, during college, when the summer comes, they they leave the state they live in and they go out and they knock doors for four or five months. And, and um, it was my first time out selling door to door um, for a summer program, leaving the state for it. And it was the company's first time doing out of state uh, program, which was a recipe for disaster. Um, because I was a regional manager over 60 guys and I hadn't done it and they hadn't done it. And we had a lot of complications. We ended up finishing the summer with only 12 people, terrible retention. And those 12 people consisted of my sister and my cousin and my friends that were close friends. And so, um, it was a great learning experience. I learned a lot of things not to do. And, um, but at the end of the year, the company's not, you know, they're threatening, they're not gonna be able to pay us money that they owe. Um, I just felt so responsible for the people that I had brought on that I was like, if I, I see the opportunity, but if I'm going to do this, I've got to have more control. So September of 2009, I started my own company and um, I was 22 years old and uh, sales minded at heart, but had to quickly learn. You know, I, I learned from that experience that summer is you got to have the train tracks ahead of the train. Otherwise, you know, too many sales is a, is a problem as well. And, um, and uh, from there it was, 10 years, um, every year over the previous year, we grew, uh, for 10 straight years and, uh, started out with, did about a million our first year and, and, and then just grew from there. And, you know, as you saw, we had employed about a thousand people over 10 years, over a thousand people. And at our height, we had 400 people, uh, in the organization. So I learned a ton, um, but I just learned by doing and, and going and trying and, and failing and learning from it, pivoting and, and starting over again. You, you said something about your father and how you grew up and the different thing, like at 14 years old, you get, if you want to get a car at 16, then you need to go work for it. And th there's two questions I had. The first one is like, how, what's your now recipe for raising kids? Is it like, cause there's the balance. Cause my son's 14 months and I almost said 14, like as if that's like a thing, 14 months. And, and when I look at it, I'm like, well, I don't want him just to learn hard work, like to go out there and just, mow lawns like I want him to know like how, how to have hard work but then like learn to progress and learn the other side of it too like what do you do if you're not mowing the lawns because a lot of people they just learn that and for the rest of their life they're just a technician a lot of service-based businesses plumbers and electricians that's they just stay there their whole life and they're never able to retire that's why business kind of sucks you know they're yeah. like just working they're doing the same thing uh, what's going to be your recipe of Oh, I'll buy you this thing because the lesson isn't worth learning. Like here, learn this lesson. What are you going to do? Or have yeah. you already done? I don't know. Yeah, it's tough. It's tougher than I thought it was. Right. Um, as a kid, I'm like, dad, just buy me this thing. Just do this thing. Right. And, and now I'm looking at it going, man, he wanted to, I know he wanted to. And I'm sure that like, it was hard not to do that. Um, my kid is spoiled. He's five years old. 
and uh, he's spoiled. And um, we're teaching him how to work and we're teaching him how to think. And that's something that my dad did as, as a young kid. It was like, um, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. And so, you know, he really tried to program our minds that like you can do anything you want. So if you're mowing the lawns, the reason I transitioned from mowing lawns for somebody to mowing my own lawns and having guys working for me. And I transitioned from working for somebody washing windows to owning my own window washing company was because my dad trained me how to think. He's like, think about it. Like if you were to do this, but the fears um, was the common denominator. I think that he helped teach me that really served me that I'm going to do with my, my children as well is the only reason that you're not going from this technician to this, um, you know, entrepreneurial mindset and taking on more role, more responsibility is because, um, because of fear, you're afraid to have that conversation. You're afraid to ask that question. You're afraid to put yourself out there. Um, and he helped us learn how to look at those fears, acknowledge them and still take action anyway. And that's, that's what I want to do. I, I want to make sure that my children know, um, first and foremost, I want them to, I want to make sure that they know that they're loved and that they're accepted um, that they're good enough and that we will love them no matter what and um, that anything's possible. And um, and if, if mindset's the training that's needed in order to have those tough conversations or to put yourself out there, that's the training they'll get. If it's, you know, not wanting to get off the couch to go work, we can teach that one too. So, yeah. That's cool. And you have a five-year-old and then how long have you been married? I've been married nine years. Nine years. Dude, almost exactly the same. I got married at 20. My wife was 18. It was wild, like super yeah. young. So you guys have kind of, there, there hits this stage where it's like, you hardly even remember what it was like being, not having a relationship or your wife. And, and then also you had the transition. If you've been, you're, you've had a kid about half as long as you've been married. Right. So like, like almost the same amount of time throughout that process of building the businesses and, and then introducing a child, what's been the way that you've been able to go after your business goals and keep those a reality while maintaining a relationship as a good dad and a good husband at the same time, what have been some of the learnings? Because I, I found out that having my son, the first thing that you learn is the way you've done life doesn't work mm -hmm. anymore. Like there's new things and new responsibilities and and new things that hit the schedule that just are different. And unless you adapt, like it's just not going to work out well. How yeah. have you adapted to that and some of the learnings, even for me, I'm like four years behind. I need to know like, and tell me, tell me the secrets, the roadblocks that I can now skip over. Look, I, I, I love that you're putting me in this expert role, but I'm, I'm still learning, man. This is, this is an ongoing learning for me. Um, and you know, with that, I'd say, um, I was really at first it rocked me and I realized this, the way I've done it, it's not going to continue to work. And so I tried to go this other way of like, I got to have balance. I don't believe in balance. I don't think that things are meant to be you know, equal, but there is a fair, you know, there's a difference between fairness and equal being fair and being equal. And so, um, uh, I, I am doing the best that I can to, you know, commit the time when I'm there, be present and, and do those things. Um, you know, for me, the probably the biggest thing is when I come home from work, um, work would still keep going. My mind would still keep going on the work front. And, um, I've made, you know, a major, I've made major, um, you know, progress in the sense of um, when I'm leaving work, I try and do a wind down and then go and give uh, as much presence as I can. Even if it's, I got 15 minutes before my son goes to bed. It's like, we play hard for 15 minutes. Dad's not on his phone. I'm giving everything that I can. And then we go snuggle and, and tuck him in bed and, and, and have good conversations together. But, um, you know, I, I, I've gone away with this, Hey, there's gotta be a perfect balance and there doesn't. Sometimes you're going to be much heavier focused on your family and sometimes you're going to be much heavier focused on, on business. And, um, if I can communicate that and still be present in the moments that I get, then I see that as a win. And then inside the relationship side as well, with you yeah. and your wife, now you got like a little one and you got the business and you're not able to just do things on the times that you want when you have a kid, all of a sudden now there's like a different dynamic than when you were just married. Yep. What's been the way that you've navigated that over the years to make sure that you're investing in the relationship. I know this is a big thing for the guys. Like we can't outsource this relationship that we have with ourselves, with our significant other. And so I always tell them like, no one's going to have sex with your wife for you. No one's going to communicate to her for you, or yeah. at least you don't want them to. So we should probably get pretty good at it. Like yeah. this might be something that would be worth, 
investing in and becoming a master of, or at least better at, how have you navigated those waters as well? Not just with kids, but then also with your wife. Yeah. I, I love how you frame some of that. And you know, there's definitely gotta be an intention there. Um, something that we integrated was date night, uh, making sure that we do a date night at least once a week um, where it's just the two of us. We've got a sitter, we spend that time and we have that to look forward to. There's, it sets up a good opportunity for communication. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I dove into personal development and was working on myself a lot and doing, you know, doing a lot of, a lot of introspection and my wife and I were in a good place. Our relationship was in a good place. I know when we first got married, we actually really struggled. Like it was like a shell shock. Some people like they're in the honeymoon phase. They just lovey dovey. Our first year was hell. Like it was hell. Like if this is how it's going to be, I don't know if I can do this. And so we were in therapy at the time we were going to a therapist and it was a terrible experience, honestly. The, it wasn't probably the right fit therapy wise and everything else. Fast forward a number of years, seven years later, eight years later, um, things are actually pretty good. But I, in this personal development space, realized it could be better. And and why do we always just go to get help when there's a fire? Why, why can't we go when there's not? And so I reached out to my wife and just said, hey, I think we should go to therapist and like see if they're, they, uh, uh, you and I have gotten ourselves as far as we can get ourselves. Um, maybe a third party can help us go to another level and, and make our, our marriage that much more exceptional. And, um, and she agreed and, and, um, found a, we found a therapist and, you know, it was super powerful for us. And I recommend this to anyone is like, we weren't fighting. We weren't looking at divorce. We weren't going through, you know, all the reasons why people go to a therapist, a marriage therapist, we weren't in any of those moments, but we went and it was super profound. We learned tools to communicate with each other. We realized reasons why things weren't going, um, you know, why we would react certain ways and why things, you know, were hold things that were holding us back. And so um, that was super, super profound. And the third thing is we love to travel and it's the thing that we always have something on the books that we're looking forward to. Um, at least we did before all this craziness went down. Um, but we would, you know, we'd travel a few times a year and, um, that's a time. And it's one of her favorite times. She's like, I can, I can be present, um, for moments, but when we're on vacation, I like, I'm all in on vacation. Like I check yeah. out, I leave my business partners and everyone else knows like, you're not getting a hold of me. And if you do, like, you're not going to like the results. <laughs> I'm just checked yeah. out. Then uh, I'm fully there and I just, I'm a little kid and I just love to have fun. So um, that's cool. So like date, date nights, intentional time together uh, outside of that, like investing in the relationship, things that maybe you would do when you have a fire, doing it before you have fire and then things to look forward to that were, sounds like your common interests. You guys both love to travel. I know my wife and I, this year, that was something that we put on. We've gone to San Diego and Florida and then San Antonio, which wasn't far away, but it's like just something to like do these little staycations yeah. and you always sit there every month and you're like oh like if we just make it to this day and we work hard like we get to go do this thing and we get to be present uh, one of my friends brian Poulin, has a great quote that he said that was there's no such thing as rest without work mm. and like separate it's like if i work the only way you can have rest is if there's something called work because it's the opposite of it and if i can work really hard then i can go and i can rest really hard and i can not blend the two which i feel like i did pretty much my whole life is I would kind of like never really rest because I just was always in this working momentum that you were talking about as well. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing those dynamics it, yeah. when it comes to roles. And I don't know why I care. I'm going down this way with you, but you're like, I'm not an expert in this. I'm like, I don't care. We're going down it. Okay. When it comes to roles, what's been your guys's roles with business and family? Meaning my wife and I, we started working together and building that she's our COO. And so that was a, really cool dynamic to work together this whole time. Yeah. It's not for everyone. A, a lot of people dream of it, then they try and they hate it. Do you guys work together at all or work on projects together? Like what does that look like? Yeah. So um, when I say, when I think about the roles, it's like, she's the CEO of the home. Um, she's the nurturer here. It's kind of her space. She, you know, she's, she's got a very good pulse on what's going on here at home with the teaching and the discipline and I'm a terrible discipline person, by the way, like, I just want to have fun. I'm like, Oh, this isn't that big a deal. We'll correct this behavior later type thing. Yeah. yeah. He's got <laughs> that down. Um, and then, you know, business, she really trusts me and our business and our investments and everything else. But, That's cool. uh, but she plays a very important role and has for all my businesses as 
um, networking and relationships are so crucial to the success of our businesses. And so um, she's she's right there with me in in you know taking on and, and becoming friends and and getting to know and putting herself out there and having conversations with those that are most important to our business and. Um, and that's where she's played a, a massive role, you know, in the door to door business, um, you're recruiting people to come out and, and, and knock doors and, and be straight commission, you know, um, and, and really take a ride with you and put a lot of trust in you. And, and she played a very important role in, in helping build trust with the, the spouses and, 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 uh, with all of the different partners in the business. So that's been, that's been fascinating and, and very, very helpful. That's awesome, man. I appreciate you sharing that. So many different dynamics in the household, not just this old school version of like, this is how we think it's supposed to be in movies. You know, for me, like my wife loves looking at investments that she can make with her money. Like we went and looked at 10 acres the other day. That was her like so different, right? You just talked about your wife trusts you with the investments and the, and running the business. And for me, like, it's like this different blend and so many different variables and personalities and all these different things go into it. So I think it's really cool to see the different perspectives. Also, I want to touch on this though. Yeah. For you, you're in this new cool opportunity where you're like kind of building and selling these businesses. Give me the high level overview of how you saw the opportunity, what you're doing with the businesses and the game plan that you have. I want to see if I could take anything away from it to maybe do something new for myself as well. Yeah. So, um, after I exited my my uh, door to door company, I started doing some consulting and I did some consulting in different spaces. And um, one of the areas was in healthcare. And healthcare, I saw a ton of opportunity. It's like where else in the world do people still use fax machines? You know, you look at our high tech world and everything else, and it's like there's a lot of old broken systems. Um, however, there's also a lot of like not so fun parts of like the healthcare space and the regulations and the landmines that are out there and and the way that you know things are very ambiguous. And, and so, um, I was, I was talking about this with a friend. I was like, man, I just really don't, you know, I, I, I have this love hate relationship. I think there's a ton of opportunity. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to, to solve some big problems. And, and I was like, but where do I go? And, and he made this mention, he's a, a incredible marketer. He made this comment of like, well, um, I had a, I think it was an uncle or brother-in-law or some, some relative that asked him to do marketing for their dental practice. And he's like, if I'm going to do the marketing for a dental practice, I might as well own it. So that was his mind going towards uh, healthcare. And I was like, interesting. Well, can you own a dentist practice if you're not a dentist? He's like, I think so. I don't know. And so that was like this spark of this moment. I was like, well, let me look into that. And so as I did, one, I hated going to the dentist growing up. I was like, man, that was a terrible experience. I still hate going there um, to the dentist. But um, I was like, what if we could make that experience better? And turns out, you know, you can own a dental practice in a number of states. And then the ones you can't, you can own a management company that owns the assets and does all the non-clinical aspect of things. And so there's there's ways to to impact that industry. And so as I, as I went further down the road, what was most fascinating to me was the misalignment is to uh, the way that business was being done and, and the opportunity for alignment really aligned with what I wanted. And so uh, what I mean by that is doctors, dentists, they don't go to business school. They go to dental school. They're really good technicians. They're not great businessmen most of the time. And um, and so, you know, they, they think they want to own this practice, but they get in and they realize, man, I just want to clock in, clock out, work four days a week, make 250K a year, call it good. I don't want to deal with hiring, firing, you know, training and, and scheduling and collections and all the business side of things. I just don't, they don't want to. And so um, they're opened a door of like, man, why don't we go give them what they want and we can take the part that we want and we can actually do a better job um, at the business side of things. And then so happens COVID hits and dentists are shut down for three months. And if you're not a, if you're not a, a business person um, and you don't think business minded, you have cash flow and that means that you're doing fine and you don't plan ahead. And so when cash flow comes, you get a uh, cash flow squeeze comes, you're in a tight spot. And so there's a lot of dentists that are in a, a tight spot, especially the ones that were getting close to retirement. They're like, well, let's speed this retirement thing up because our books got hit this year. And so um, when that happened, it was like, Hey, it's game time. We got to go. Um, I had been doing research um, and uh, when COVID hit and I saw some of these opportunities out there in the acquisition space, um, we jumped and, and, um, now on four, four dental practices and, and, uh, goals to, to buy 20, um, over the next two years. 
uh, roll them up, optimize them, get the economies of scale, um, put some scheduling and collections processes in place to make these things uniform, make a centralized brand. And with most businesses, you know, um, where the big opportunity there is for me is when you buy one individual standalone business, it's worth X multiple of, of EBITDA. Um, but when you have uh, a number of those, um, they're worth a much bigger multiple of EBITDA and the buyer is a lot different. Uh, you've got a much bigger buyer. And so there's an arbitrage opportunity to just buy low and sell high. And um, that's kind of the game that I'm, I'm taking on right now. That's cool. It's cool to see opportunity. You're taking something that you said, it's like someone who's a technician doesn't know how to run the business. And you're obviously great at building the rapport and, and, and coming in there and, and working with these people to have, you want your dentist to be a great technician. Like you don't want him to be a great business person, to be honest. Like sure. uh, I don't, I'd want him to be really good at what he does and that's awesome. And then also having the person over here that's marketing and, and getting people in the door and making sure there's retention and collection and all the things that are usually not really done well, cause they don't know how to do it. They didn't go to school for that. What a cool opportunity. So for people listening, think, just broaden the thoughts that you have and the things that you do by listening to something like this, you go, man, where's the opportunity for me? Is it right now? Is it later? Is it a different industry? I think that's really awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for investing time with us in the Billion Dollar Brotherhood. For the guys listening, thank you as well. Make sure to go follow this guy. What's the best way people go connect with you? Instagram, you're on Clubhouse. I've yeah. ditched Clubhouse because I can't listen to people for eight hours on Sunday. So <laughs> I need, I want to get, it's so crazy. Three days, I'm on Clubhouse. I'm like, man, this is a huge opportunity. And then I get off for like two days and I feel like, Oh man, I don't know if I want to go back there again. <laughs> it's so weird. I don't know if you've been on there lately. But. I haven't been. I haven't. Um, but I think there's a space for it. There's a use for it. I just think I got to find it because I got kind of crazy um, when I first started and that's, that's not sustainable. So, uh, but yeah, you can find me on any of the social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, um, at Jeremy Nevis. Um, Nevis is seven backwards. Makes it easy to understand. I remember um, it's actually at Jeremy Nevis underscore, but I think you put in my name, you'll be fine to find me. And um, yeah, I'd love to connect with you and, and uh, help any way I can. Awesome, man. So, thanks so much again. Thank you.